about seven words of Christmas. I want us to look at seven words of Christmas. Now, if you're anything like me, you look at this and you think, let's see, it's 1135, seven words. <sighs> How long per word? Did any of you think that? You did, didn't you? <laughs> Maybe Lisa is so kind. She's such a good Christian. She's saying, no, I didn't think that. But I know a lot of the rest of us, it's, it's sort of human nature. We kind of think that, don't we? Okay, seven words. How long is this going to be? Uh, this morning is going to be informal, and we're going to just look briefly. Each one of these, uh, each one of these words, we could... We could have a sermon on each one of these words. I promise you we won't. Um, it's going to be um, just, just briefly, but I do encourage you then to go on on your own and read again the Christmas story. If you have not yet, go back again to Matthew 1, Matthew 2, and go back again to Luke 1 and Luke 2. Now, there are other places you can read, but definitely in the New Testament, Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, they give us the Christmas story. And of course, what we heard this morning with some of the passages, in fact, I grabbed it from uh, Panina. I thought this fits with what I want to talk about this morning, the passage that she read from Ephesians as well. And we, we start looking at what Christmas is and what Jesus has come to do and give each one of us, and we see that it's really the whole Bible, isn't it? It really is all of God's Word. But we're going to look at seven words this morning, and as I talk about seven words of Christmas, I want us to think about it in a different way. And when I say words, I really want to talk about prophecies, um, the pro prophecies of God. So that sounds kind of mis a little bit mysterious to some of us. Oh, it's a prophecy. Well, what about this or that? But I want to make it very simple for us this morning. And what I want to say is this, prophecy is simply God speaking to us. It is. It's God speaking to us. It's God telling us his intention. It's God giving us his promise. And we heard some of the verses this morning, and you know that we quote this sometimes um, here at Lighthouse. God keeps every promise he makes. That was our theme. And, and that, oh, that's one of the verses that just has, has, that resonates with my heart and continues to resonate with my heart. And so prophecy is, is simply God speaking to us and God's promise, a uh, very real promise to us that he will fulfill, has fulfilled, or is fulfilling in our lives. And so these seven words of Christmas are words of prophecy that have come because of Jesus. And we're going to look at them this morning. And don't be, don't be scared. There are quite a few verses, but we're not going to read them all. I just want to give you a picture. And in fact, this morning with all of the people who were reading, uh, reading the Christmas story to us, we've covered a lot of these verses already. So let's look at the first one from, oops, oop, there we go. Okay. Uh, from Matthew 1, 20 through 21. And this is Joseph, this prophecy. These, and these prophecies are to different people. Uh, these words are to different people. And if you read Matthew 1 and 2, and if you read Luke 1 and 2, you will see that these seven words of Christmas show up again and again and again, not just in one place. I believe God does not want us to miss his promise and his word his words and his promises to us that are found that are found in what we celebrate as Christmas in the coming of Jesus and this first one is in Matthew 1 20 through 21 and this is Joseph who is given a dream and, and an angel of the Lord appears and as far as you know it, it, it would have been Gabriel we believe and he says Joseph son of David don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in hers by the Holy Spirit. Now here's the verse for us this morning. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Brothers and sisters, here's the first word of Christmas. And the first word of Christmas is salvation. Very, very simply, it's salvation. And we all know that, we say, yeah, 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 I know that. But we forget it, don't we? Be, be, before anything else, beyond anything else, the foundation of everything else, the, the premier message of Christmas is salvation. It's salvation. It is found in the message that the angel gives to Joseph. He says, name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. 
when Gabriel appears to Mary, actually before Joseph, because um, by the time Joseph gets this, receives this dream, he already knows Mary knows that Mary is pregnant. So Mary has already heard from Gabriel, and Gabriel says, you will name him Jesus. And she knew what Jesus meant. Any good Jewish person knew that Jesus meant God is our salvation, or the God who saves. And salvation is the first word of Christmas. Jesus is the Greek form because we're reading in the New Testament. But if we go back to the Old Testament, we find the name Jesus in the Old Testament as well, don't we? What is the name in the Old Testament? It's not Greek in the Old Testament. It's in Hebrew. What is the name in the Old Testament? Joshua. That's right. I love it that we have so many Joshuas at Lighthouse. We have... At one point, we had four Joshuas at Lighthouse, and I had to ask this Joshua this morning who just came back from the U.S., now, Joshua, what am I supposed to call you? And he said, Jay. I said, okay, let's call him Jay. Um, but if we look at this name, Jesus, we go all the way back to the Old Testament. It is first seen in Joshua, Joshua the son of Nun. That was not his name. If you go back and look, originally, he had a slightly different name, and Moses renamed him Joshua. Don't you think God had a hand in that? And all the way back in the Old Testament, we have a glimpse of the salvation of God that would come one day in the promised Savior, Jesus Christ. And God moved the heart of Moses to name this young general, this young fighter, this young man who would lead them out of the wilderness into the promised land, named him Joshua. The Lord saves in a picture and in a foreshadowing of Jesus who would one day come and lead us out of darkness and lead us out of sin and into salvation and into a right relationship with God. Brothers and sisters, the first word of Christmas, the first message of Christmas is and must be salvation, salvation. We read it this morning, the, 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 um, the various people who were reading. One of the prophecies is also from Simeon a little bit later in Luke chapter 2. And we're going to look at some of Sim what uh, Simeon says in just a minute. But I really encourage you. I love what Simeon says. He's led by the Holy Spirit to the temple on the eighth day, and he happens to see Mary and Joseph with Jesus. And he says, he says a lot of things that are so beautiful, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then even Simeon says, Now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. What had his eyes seen? A baby. God in the flesh. Jesus. Salvation. Salvation then and salvation now. Jesus, our salvation. And brothers and sisters, that's the first word of Christmas. If you miss anything else this morning, don't miss this word. And if you miss anything else this morning, don't miss this gift. It's the gift of salvation. And God offers it through Jesus. And if, you haven't, if you're not yet saved this morning, this morning is a great time to say, God, I receive your gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. So the first word of Christmas, amen, is salvation. Let's look at the next one. Now this one's a little bit longer, but we'll just go through quickly. And this is one of the stories that is related to the story um, of Christmas. And this is the story of the birth of John, whom we call uh, uh, John the Baptist. I, I spoke with Elizabeth, little Elizabeth, this morning. I said, Elizabeth! you have a Christmas name. And she said, what? I said, you have a Christmas name because her name is Elizabeth. And um, this is the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we know this, so this is found in Luke, the first chapter of this, because he's going to introduce Jesus. So here are Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah is a priest. We know this story. They, they are godly people. They're righteous people. They're just and devout people. But they have no children because she could not conceive and both of them were well along in years. And so there are two things going on that make this impossible. First of all, she's barren. When she was young, she was barren. When she was of childbearing age, she was unable to bear children. And now she's past childbearing age. And so we see this part of the story. And then 
Zechariah goes in. We know the story, so this is just a reminder. He's in. He's serving. Uh, he's he's at the uh, uh, at the altar of incense, and then he sees an angel. As we find out, it's Gabriel. Gabriel, the messenger of God, right? The messenger of God. He's startled. He's overcome with fear. But the angel says, "Don't be afraid." Oh, there's a good word for us, isn't isn't there? And Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you. So even though they were old, even though Elizabeth was barren, Zechariah was still praying for an answer. What I want to say to you this morning is this. There are some of us also this morning who are in pretty impossible situations, right? Are some of you in impossible situations? But you're still praying, aren't you? Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. If Zechariah had stopped praying and said, well, this is just the way it is, maybe John the Baptist would have come to another couple. But Zechariah kept on, on praying. And then he speaks to him, and I want you to see what Zechariah says, because you know, as, as I was preparing last night, I thought, oh, Lord, this is just like us. It really is. Zechariah says, how can I know this? Now, you and I are so quick to judge, aren't we? Gabriel appears in the temple and speaks a word that is the answer to the prayer, and Zechariah doesn't believe it. What does he say? How can I know this? Or some translations say, how can this be? Um, For I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Husbands, may I say something to you? This is a side point. This is not part of the Christmas story, but husband, take a lesson from Zechariah this morning. Zechariah says, I'm an old man, but of his wife, he says, she's well along. <laughs> he doesn't say, and my wife is old too. There's a lesson for you this morning, <laughs> husbands, right there. Um, so don't you, th don't you love it that God p has humor in his word too? God laughs. God has a good sense of humor. The, the sense of humor that we have, God gave us. God gave us. It's a wonderful gift. But Zechariah says, well, how can I know this? But what he really means, what he means, if you look at what happens next is, Zechariah doesn't believe it. He's been praying for it. An angel appears, and Zechariah says, but basically he says, well, how can this be? How like us this is. We ask God, we pray, and we still only look at our own resources, right? We only look at what we have. We only look at what we can do, what we can accomplish. Well, this is all I have. This is all I can do. Brothers and sisters, oh, we're connected with God, and God can do anything. And so Zechariah doesn't believe, even though he's been praying for it. And the angel answered him, I can... You know what? I can imagine Gabriel. Now, we don't know if angels, if, there are, if Gabriel had wings or not. We don't know, but I can imagine Gabriel going, Hoof! his wings going up like that, kind of fluffing out, you know? And I'm sorry, that's just me. I, I'm tired. My, my brain has been traveling a long way. But I can see the, the wings going Hoof! like that, and Gabriel putting his hands on his hips like this and saying, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. <laughs> and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now, we don't know how he said it, but it does seem that there's, a there's some rebuke there, doesn't there? There's some rebuke there um, for, the unbelie for the unbelief. And we know that the story, we know what happens. We know that Zechariah, because he didn't believe, then um, he is struck dumb. Uh, for he struck uh, he struck mute um, for the length of the preg of the pregnancy that will be and then we read a little bit further soon afterwards his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and she said the Lord has done this for me I love this picture and I hope you see this picture as well Elizabeth knew God it had nothing to do with our own ability or our own power or our own strength to produce a child God you did this in us you did this in us and then we go a little bit further. This is further along in the story. And this is when Mary comes into the picture. And the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary and says, you're going to have a child too. Now Mary also says, how can this be? But her question is different from Zechariah's question. 
Mary believes, but her question is, uh, I'm a virgin. How can this be? How, how, how are you going to do it, God? <laughs> okay. And Gabriel says, and here's, here's the point for us. He says, consider your relative Elizabeth. She, even she has conceived a son in her old age. One is before it's possible. One is after it's possible. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. Here you go, brothers and sisters. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible. The second word of Christmas for us is hope. It's hope. It's hope. Some of us this morning are in hopeless situations. When we were thanking the Lord just a little bit ago, one of you said, oh, I thank the Lord for, it was Moses. He said, oh, without hope I would be nothing. This is one of the words of Christmas. And you say, but that was a promise to Elizabeth. That was a promise to Mary. What about me? What does the Bible say? The God of all hope. The God of all hope. Brothers and sisters, nothing is impossible with God. If you've been praying about something, keep praying. Stop looking at your own work resources. Stop figuring out, how can I make it work? And really let God start lifting your eyes to Him, how He will work this out. This is a message for, for us, for some, you know, the, among these seven words this morning, there will be something for everybody here this morning. Salvation, hope. And we see this, one of, the, one of the prophecies, one of the communications of God to us through Christmas is hope. It's hope. And there's hope in him. Don't be like Zechariah. Pray, 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 but it's impossible. It can't be. It can't be. It can be. It can be, because it doesn't depend on our resources. It depends on God, and with God, nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. Amen. Amen. What's the next one? Let's keep on going. And then we see in Luke, Gabriel goes to Mary, and he says to her, look at, we'll look at verse 28. We're not going to read all of, all of them. This is Gabriel again, the messenger angel. Look at verse 28. And the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman. The Lord is with you. You know, these days, we wouldn't call a... Uh, Mary was perhaps about 14 years old. That would have been very normal for marriage at that time. We wouldn't call a 14-year-old a woman, would we? We'd say, a girl, a girl. But the angel says to her, he says, rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But Mary is very troubled by this. What's going on? I don't understand this. She wondered what this greeting could be. And then look with me at verse 30, and you're going to see the word in two places already, the, the message from God. Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What is the third prophetic word that God speaks to us through Christmas? What is it? Favor. It's the word favor. Favor or favored. And this word is really, we look at this and we kind of think, well, does that mean like favorite? Like Mary was a favorite with God? You know, Mary was more favorite with God than others. And so she gave birth um, to Jesus. And then some of us are sitting here and we think, but that word of prophecy is not for me because that was Mary. Right? Do some of us think that? We do from our church backgrounds, don't we think that's Mary? And Mary was favored. But I want you to see something this morning as we think about this word. It's a Greek word, and the Greek word is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. Some of us have heard that word before, haven't we? Charismatic, char we've heard that word before. What does the word charis mean? It's translated throughout the New Testament. What does that word mean? It means grace. It means grace. And as we look at this, it's very simply. The word we read here is favor or favored, but it means very, very simply grace. And the third word of prophecy of Christmas that God gives to us this morning is grace. God speaks grace to you and it's found in Christmas. Ah, oh, but you say, but that's Mary. Well, let's go a little bit further. The angel speaks to the shepherds. Who are the shepherds? Nobodies, nobodies. And what is the message that comes? 
Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people on whom his favor rests, on whom his grace rests. Does God's grace rest on you this morning? It does. The Bible is so clear. The Bible, um, uh, Panina was reading it this morning, and that's why I reached over and I grabbed her I grabbed her scriptures just as a reminder. Go back and read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Our, uh, all praise to God who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Ah, so here we have, it's this favor that's being displayed in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us. When you and I were unlovely, God loved us. Before we knew him, God loved us. Before we loved him, God loved us. He has set his favor upon us. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Some of the Bible translations say, peace on earth to people with whom he is pleased, right? Brothers and sisters, he's pleased with you. He's pleased with me. If you have an idea that God is disappointed in you, that God is mad with you, that you don't measure up, that you're not good enough, other people are, but you're not, because you've messed up too much, that does not come from God. Because he says to you, my favor rests upon you. My grace rests upon you. And that's one of the words of God to us this Christmas. Amen. Amen. The grace of God is upon us. What's next? Look at Luke 1, 78, 79. This is when Zechariah has, um, he's rejoicing over the birth of his son, John the Baptist. Uh, now he can speak. Um, and he, boy, does he start speaking once God releases his, releases his tongue. He starts pouring out. The Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he began to speak. So here's the prophecy of God coming out. And let's look at verses 78 and 79. But there's much more. So I encourage you to go on and you read it for your, read other ones for yourself. Look at what he says. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. I love, I love that picture. And the next word that God speaks to us is light. It's light. I was speaking with uh, Pastor Renna yesterday morning as Melrose and I were in the van early in the morning. We were on our way back to Manila from La Union. And she was telling us about one of the workers in her church in Mindanao. Her name is Sister Arceli. Um, and it was interesting because uh, as we were talking, Melrose and I were laughing about it. Renna was telling us things and she was excited about it. And, you know, she's pretty small, but she's got a really big voice. She's got a really big voice. And so she's telling us about Arceli. And um, she said, she said, oh, I wish you could, the, the testimony of Sister Arceli. Um, when Renna would be preaching or teaching in the church, this was before Arceli was a Christian, and she would just be walking. She lived in the area. And she would walk back and forth uh, along the road that's close to the church. And she did not. She wasn't living a life of blessing or grace or favor. And she had all sorts of medical issues, all sorts of medical problems, great depression, and, and just it was the, the hardness of her life and her physical condition was seen outwardly in her body and especially in her face. And then she would walk by the church and she would hear Pastor Renna and others teaching in the church. And sometimes she would just sit down on the road outside on a stone on Sundays or other days and just listen to what was being said. And gradually, the truth of God and the words of God entered her heart and she accepted the Lord and her life was changed. And the difference in her countenance was amazing. In fact, she, even on her countenance, um, Renna told us it was like it was dark before and then it was light. She even posted on Facebook a before and after picture <laughs> so that people could 
so that people could see the difference God had made in her life. There was now light. There was now light. And when Jesus comes, all oh, that beautiful picture, the, the morning light is about to dawn upon us. And brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you this morning is this. If you feel this morning that your life is in darkness, if you feel I'm living under a cloud, I feel I'm living under a burden, it's so heavy, there's so light. We live in a pretty dark world, don't we? But God promises us, and he keeps his promise. The morning light has dawned upon us in Jesus Christ. And, and, and you'll find this, this prophecy throughout Scripture. You'll find it in Isaiah. You'll find it in Simeon when he prophesies in the temple as well. The light of God has come. The, the converse of that, I've told you before when I was teaching in China and teaching at Peking University and one of my students that was searching for the truth um, and was very open to God, but I, remember I told you that instead of walking towards God, she went into Qigong and her countenance over the course of that semester, her countenance changed. Literally, it was as if there was a cloud over her. He is the prince of darkness. I don't want to live in that kingdom. And brothers and sisters, the morning light has dawned. You and I do not have to live in darkness or under a cloud. The morning light has dawned. And God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. Light is the promise of God to us. This is the uh, this is this is part of it as well, and we'll we'll look at more um, a little bit later. Uh, but we're going to move on into a, a different section as well. But look at this. This is Simeon in verse thirty-two. This is part of his prophecy when he sees Jesus. He says he is a light to reveal reveal God to the nations. Some of you, your translations in the Bible will say, instead of nations, it will say Gentiles. Any Gentiles here this morning? <laughs> all of us, as far as I know. Okay, all of us, as far as I know. And Jesus came, the promise of God, the prophecy of God, the word of Christmas to us this morning is his light has come. His light has come. You don't have to live in darkness. Now let's look at this as the next passage as well. And so we've looked at, what's the first word? Salvation. What's the second word? Hope. Hope. What's the third word? Favor. Favor. What's the fourth word? Light. Light. Okay, let's look at the fifth word. See, you were worried this was going to be an hour and a half. We're moving pretty fast, aren't we? But I, I do encourage you, there's so much more here. Go back and look on your own. Uh, Simeon is waiting. The Holy Spirit has spoken to him. He believes he's going to see the Messiah. The Holy Spirit leads him to the temple that day. Oh, beautiful picture. We'll look at it in just a minute. Um, that Actually, we'll look at it now. Verse 27. That day. Look at verse 27. That day. This is day number eight for the Jewish. So Jesus would be taken to the temple. He would be circumcised at the temple. And he would be officially named Jesus at the temple that day. And here's this beautiful picture. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. Oh, I love that. Brothers and sisters, what is the word? What is the word? Keep looking for it. Now, you're not going to see this word directly, but it's indirectly, and it, to me it leaps out from the Christmas story as well. You'll see it here again. Here's another part of the story. Uh, the Magi, the wise men have come. They've given their gifts. And then when it's time to leave, what do they do? They return another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So the wise men go on. Then an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. What's the, what's the next word of Christmas? I think the next word of Christmas is guidance. If you will read the Christmas story, you will see that throughout the story, God guides, God tells people what to do, God leads at just the right time. 
Most of you here this morning are parents with families uh, and kids. I cannot, I, I'm, as you know, I'm single. I can't imagine the pressure that is on you at times to make decisions for the good of your family, right? What, what should we do? How can we do it? Where should we go? Where should my kids go to school? Uh, what, where should we be living? Uh, where, all these questions that you and I, that, that you have um, for yourself and for your families as well. I believe one of the words of Christmas, one of the prophetic words of God to you this morning, whether you're in a family, have kids or, or not, those of us that are single, we have plenty of decisions to make as well, don't we? We have plenty of decisions. Where shall I live? How, how can I do this? Where, can, where should I go? I believe the story of Christmas shows us that God is a God who guides. He will guide us through this life, where to go, what to do, where your kids should go, what type of job should you do, should you take this job or not take this job, should you work with this person or not work with this person, is this a good plan or not a good plan, is this a good investment or a poor investment. God is the God of guidance. He's the God of guidance, and he will guide us. Some of us really need that this morning, don't we? What should we do? When should we do it? All of that is part of it, brothers and sisters. That was found in the passage we read with Simeon. The Holy Spirit led him, and on that day, he was there when Joseph and Mary came in. Guidance is part of it. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us because we know the passage, Isaiah 9, 6. This child that is born to us, this son that is given to us, will be called what? Wonderful Counselor. Surely the Wonderful Counselor in our lives will give us good counsel, won't he? He will give us good counsel. And some of us are, to use just a common expression, we're freaking out right now. Right? Some of you have decisions to make and you're really kind of, what will I do? How will I do it? And it may very well be that the guidance God is going to give you is still waiting on his timing. It's waiting on his timing. And from Isaiah 11:2 as well, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. What is, uh, this is resting on Jesus, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel. Some of you this morning need to receive this message from God that he is going to guide you. He's going to guide you. This is not from me. I didn't make this up. This is part of Christmas. This is one of the words of Christmas for some of us this morning. And then, let's keep on going. <sighs> Grab your breath very quickly. Two more, ready? Okay. And these, these you already know very well. You know the angel appears. You've been waiting for this one. Don't, you know this word's going to be one of the prophetic words of God to us, don't you? Come all the way down here. The angel speaks to them. They sing. And what do they say? Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Peace to men and women and people on whom his favor rests. So we've already established. Does his favor rest on you? Yes or no? Yes. So is his peace available to us today? It is. It is. And oh, how we need it. There are so many things around us that rob our peace, right? Um, we, we get into a disagreement with somebody, our peace is gone. We have problems at work, our peace is gone. We have health issues, our peace is gone. Something doesn't turn out as we planned, and our peace is gone. Let the word of God speak to you his word this morning one of the words of christmas let him speak peace to you this morning and that shouldn't surprise us because he is the prince of peace the prince of peace, the prince of peace. amen amen and then finally whew, last one last one matthew 1 21 through 23 this is the angel speaking to Joseph. And then this is Matthew talking about it. And he refers to a prophecy all the way back hundreds of years earlier, verse 23. Uh, verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. That's why I started this morning with saying prophecy is God's word to us. And God keeps his word, doesn't he? God keeps his word 
the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him what Emmanuel which means God with us God with us and the last word of Christmas now there are more than that you can find your own words these are the words for us this morning the last word is presence presence you say oh yay I love presents not that kind of presence folks <laughs> there is no T on the end there is no S on the end it is C E and it's spelled the same way but it means something very very different doesn't it it is God with us and that's the Word of God to us it is God with us why can we have peace because God is with us why can we have salvation because God is with us why do we have hope because he's with us why can we have guidance when we don't know what to do because he is with us why is there favor and grace upon our lives because God is with us and the Bible tells us he was well pleased with his son. Remember what, what God said when Jesus was baptized? Here is my son. With him I am well pleased. And Jesus lives in us. His presence is with us. His presence. Amen. Amen. Emmanuel. God with us. Nothing that will break. The batteries won't wear out. We won't get tired of it. We won't find some, something or someone who's newer and shinier and better. His presence is with us. This is the seventh word of Christmas. And so this morning as we close in prayer, we've heard seven words. I'm just going to ask you to close in prayer with me. And I don't know which of these things you need in your life this morning. But surely... Surely, among all of these things that God speaks to us this morning, there's a word for your heart. There's a word for my heart. Is it salvation? Hope. Favor. The grace of God. Light in your darkness. Guidance. And you really need to know what to do and what decision to make. Presence. Presence. Close with me in prayer this morning. Amen. Oh, sorry. I got it. This was at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Just switch those two. Peace and presence. Thank you. You're paying attention. God's here this morning. This is, I'll, we'll just leave this up so you can take a picture. So take a picture and then let's pray. Amen. And I just invite you to open your heart this morning to, you've heard the words of God, but God now wants to minister to us this morning. And um, Stephen, would you just, just play or, sorry, Stephen probably wants to pray. You're okay.